Welcome to the Natural Passages Podcast. It's about revealing the unmarked doors of life. My name's Herb Stevenson. And I'm Sahadeo Rabharak. We are delighted to have you join us as we engage in an ongoing conversation about the ever-changing world of spiritual awakening. In the weeks ahead, we'll be sharing my own 30-year journey, which ranges from moments of seriousness to moments of humor. My intention is that my experience will resonate with you and help you gain insight into your own unique journey. Anticipate thought-provoking discussion, shared perspectives, and moments of laughter as we explore the concept of living in the present moment. During our time on this podcast, we delve into the practical aspects of spirituality. We'll be offering simple techniques and different viewpoints to assist you on your personal spiritual path. So, take a minute. Unwind, relax, and let's embark on this enlightening journey together. Thank you for tuning in. Good to see you again. Great to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. I like being in your presence. That's mutual. So I I understand you have some questions for me. Yes. So one of the questions that I have is last time we were talking about the natural passages in life. Um, What are... From your perspective, what are the passages? Is there like a list of five? Like how many passages do we go through? Is there an, one that's like kind of pre-programmed for lack of a better? Sure, term? sure. Okay. Um, if you go back into the indigenous cultures, uh, depending on the culture, they would have a rite of passage mm-hmm. periodically. So one of them that's most well known is when people, uh, we, we still have these, some of these passages. So for the Jewish community, it's bar mitzvah and bat mitzvahs. Uh, for the Native Americans, it's when they would go do a, um, a various uh, types of vision quests, which were actually, we call them vision quests. Mm-hmm. Um, they were actually called lamenting for a vision, which is I'm crying to remember why I came onto the earth. Mm. And so it would be four days without food and water and Mm -hmm. in the woods to face fears and do various things, which would be a way of transferring from um, childhood to adulthood, beginning Mm -hmm. to realize there's more to life. And they were teaching and stuff. From the Natural Passages program, what I've done is is, uh, I've integrated the medicine wheel from indigenous cultures with uh, Jungian psychology, Robert Monroe, as well as Carl Jung. So there's four distinct parts of us that we go mm-hmm. through chronologically. So if we just stick with men, and, and mm-hmm. I'll reverse it for women, uh, a passage for men is is usually between zero and 10, a boy, based on what's role modeled to them, formulates their masculine energy. Mm-hmm. Masculine energy mm-hmm. basically means the courage to be present. And, and, and the, the courage to show up to life. Mm. Then at 10, 5 to t- uh, 10 uh, is starting point. Now it's, it's earlier because they go to school. Boys were sent to school to do what? To learn. Mm-hmm. And that's a place um, where when you're learning, you're learning what's called magic. Mm-hmm. Read, write, arithmetic. That's all magic to the mind. It's like, oh, how do you do that? You know, one plus one. Oh, that means two, and, it, and mm-hmm. it, it's magical. Yeah. And so, but it also is laying the groundwork for what's going to be the vocation of how they work in life. In the old days, it was they learned how to plant, hunt, do various other things. Mm-hmm. So that's a natural progression. And so that one's about respect. And the respect is interesting. It's respect for yourself and mm-hmm. respect for others. Mm-hmm. And it becomes difficult because during that period, we're actually learning all this magic and we haven't quite developed enough to have an ethical understanding of how to use it appropriately. And that's why it's about respect for self and respect for others. Yes, yeah. Because if you get into it, addictive behavior happens during this period. So let's say it's 10 to 35, 40. Okay. It's when people get clever. Mm-hmm. How do I compete, get your job? Yeah. All sorts of crazy stuff human beings yeah. do to each other. Yeah. And as you mature, though, in the magician energy, what ends up happening is you get towards the latter part is you begin to realize that you formulate specific values. Mm -hmm. And those values then is what happens 45 to 55, 60. We learn this is men, compassion. And so you see a lot of softening of the heart and how they relate. Uh, 
and it, it's also a place where it's, it's, it's an interesting is it's during this period is there, there can be often a lot of divorces because as the man softens, um, he may not have stayed in relationship with his spouse. Um, his heart's awakening, so it gets projected onto somebody else. Mm. And we're, we're not really paying attention, and I'll elaborate on that. And then the last one is our latter part of our life. It's, it's about generosity, and then during that last place is where we realize we can initiate, create, and support change mm-hmm. in the people in our life, but we have to do it without outcome because we have to give them the freedom to be who they are. Mm-hmm. Now, it's kind of crazy we don't learn that until we're older. Yeah. In indigenous cultures, it was built in. The grandparents raised the children. Right, yeah. So they helped them develop these in a communal type of way. So when we, we look at these these stages, the, the thing that, that is struggled, and the reason I say the medicine wheel is involved, if I combine, if my grandparents supported me to learn how to have courage to be mm-hmm. fully who I am, my masculine energy, and learn how to have respect for myself and others. And I'm always doing it from the center of who I am mm-hmm. instead of what the world's telling me I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. We develop what I call internal authority. We live in a center, which is based on spiritual practices, traditions everywhere. Yeah. We always have to come back to the self. If I learn compassion and I'm integrating courage, mm-hmm. respect, and compassion, my sense of self grows further. Mm-hmm. And finally, I go to the last one, and I always bring it back to the center, mm-hmm. which is my generosity for myself and others. And so the, the stages actually do break down in various forms of, of psychology. There's other um, stage mm-hmm. programs, I, think, I guess you would call it, or models that mm-hmm. talk about the same type of thing. Um, the interesting thing is when you reverse the process and go to women, mm-hmm. uh, traditionally, the little boys learn how to fight and play and mm-hmm. sports and all that stuff, and little girls traditionally learn how to play with dolls, which means they learn how to be more relational. Mm-hmm. And because and historically they would have get married early Mm -hmm. they would move to generosity for self and others and it would be a place where they had to learn to do that because they're raising the children Mm -hmm. and he's down here learning to work and support Mm -hmm. and so they kind of stay in polar opposites and they move again she goes to the place of courage to be fully who she is and he learns compassion. And this is why mm-hmm. divorces happen because mm-hmm. she's now saying is, is, you know, I want my due. I raised those kids. Mm-hmm. You've ignored me and now you want to cuddle? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. And then she ends up in the crone and he ends up in generosity. If they both did it from an indigenous point of view of staying centered mm-hmm. and connected to each other, they have a balanced marriage and it lasts, you know, forever. What happened in modern life is she learns relationship to a degree. He learns courage, uh, and uh, but she now goes to college and learns magic. So she knows the same things he does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she's also asked to carry the burden of raising the babies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So this is why we've had so many difficulties about how do we redefine masculine and feminine energy because we've placed it into role conflicts. Mm. And so then she goes on over here and, and it gets even more courageous because she's realizing I can do everything you did. Mm-hmm. And that's why issues around the glass ceiling and things of that nature are an issue mm-hmm. because she's earned her dues. But if, they're, if they continue their progression, they end up at the top together in generosity mm-hmm. for self and others. Yeah. They have built the family that mm-hmm. they initiate support and to to be mm-hmm. who they are without attachment. Yeah. And the best example I can come up with is a parallel couple is uh, George and Barbara Bush is probably the closest to that. Okay. Family was first, core values, service to the to the country. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, am I saying it's perfect? No, but that was their core, and they did that, and that was reflected in all their kids as they ended up building their own careers. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's interesting because 
when you look at Hinduism too, it has a similar thing. Like there's four stages. Yes. The one to twenty five. I think you're supposed to like they call it the Brahmacharya stage. I could be incorrect. Um in the pronunciation, but that's your learning. So mm-hmm. everyone is supposed to go try to learn their magic or learn how whatever your craft is that you're gonna how you survive, how to build your life. And then twenty five to I think fifty is karma. That's the stage of karma, which is you I think you had mentioned this too, like the, so 40 was indulging in the pleasures of life. Mm-hmm. And then um, 50 to 75 is about um, charity, community, like giving back, generosity, right? You've built something, now you're able to make a community impact. And right. then 75 to 100 is, uh, I think, more compassion to yourself, but really building your your spiritual connection, solidifying that, and I think building your family like passing down that information so you can make an easy exit. Um, so it mirrors similar patterns. Almost all spiritual traditions yeah. have these, but we don't teach them. Yeah. And, and we, and unless you follow like in, in the Hindi uh, mm-hmm. process of, of learning the spiritual practices and mm-hmm. the dynamics and, and living them. Living them, yeah. Then what's happened is society is is we chase shiny objects, mm-hmm. okay, and instead of sitting down saying is is how does this fit to who I am mm-hmm. and who I want to be, and this has been the the biggest difficulty we have. So let's go back uh, to our prior conversation about midlife correction. So what am happening is mm-hmm. as as couples come together and they do not stay centered, yeah. A midlife correction happens, it says, that either brings them together or moves them apart. Uh, frequently, one or the other says, I'm unhappy. Mm-hmm. Uh, often they'll say, I'm unhappy as they walk out the door. But if they, the interesting part is, is if I'm unhappy, and what's really important is I, I want us to figure out how do we create the relationship mm-hmm. we want, because most marriages are not based on that. They're based on the, their parents as mm-hmm. role models, which... Uh, there are a few good ones out there, but <laughs> right. there's many that struggle with it. And so mm-hmm. the question is, is uh, my present marriage, we spent a lot of time, uh, several years, uh, defining what is it that we wanted to create as, as a mm-hmm. marriage because we're a, a cross-cultural marriage, you know, yeah. not only because of my, my racial makeup, but um, also because uh, she's Jewish. Uh, but we found our commonalities, mm-hmm. but we also found our differences, and we acknowledge those as, as is okay. Yeah. And people don't slow down enough. They just this doesn't feel good. You're bad. Right. It's the two ID right two ID right. conflict. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm not happy, it's your fault. I'm gone, and I'll go repeat the same thing again. Yeah. But those who stop and settle down and. Uh, You've heard me say, say this, one of the core things of any good relationship, if you want to stay centered, mm-hmm. every day you sit down and look at your family in the eyes for a minute, soft mm-hmm. eyes, because nobody does this. The first thing that will happen is is the, the, the wife or the kids or the spouse or the kids will say, what are you looking at? And you're going to say, you, and I don't do it enough. Mm-hmm. By the end of the week, they're going to wait to see if you're going to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. I've helped executives who had no relationship with their spouse or their mm-hmm. children end up having a relationship. And in fact, many spouses have said, I like this person. I hope he stays. Mm-hmm. So when we're not present enough going through these stages of life, mm-hmm. What ends up happening is, is we've lost our ability to stay centered. And that was the thing I was pointing out as I was mm-hmm. describing it. The center is always in the moment. Am I giving you, do I have the courage yeah. to give you the respect and compassion and generosity to see you in this moment just as you are? Mm-hmm. And if I do, you'll reciprocate. Absolutely. Like this, you just triggered for me, I think, um, a little bit of uh, the work that I've been doing for like the last couple of years. And it's been about uh, building empathy and compassion and like cultural transformation, but doing it from a person centered 
caring way. So creating a person-centered caring culture. And what you're describing is exactly that. I mean, imagine the context of a provider and a patient, right? I know nowadays providers have quotas to meet. They got to get through doctors, right? You got to see like 25 something patients a day. But the patient that's coming in, um, they're coming in with all of their ailments or concerns. If you're the provider and your mind is not grounded or present, you might miss stuff. If you're not able to communicate, ask questions, actually sit there and listen. Okay, so I know you're experiencing pain and then having further conversation to investigate like where it comes from. But I think it's about taking that time, that pausing to sit with the other person and see them as like a, a human, not just a ailment. Well, I think it's true. And, and I want to unravel that a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's taking the time mm-hmm. to stop, take a deep breath, mm-hmm. look the other person in the eyes mm-hmm. and then start. Yes, yes. But many of us use our mental capacity, our expert Mm. knowledge as a way of like an algorithm. Tell me your symptoms. I'll tell you what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Because in today's environment, you're no longer allowed to give them two aspirins and a pat in the butt. (laughs) So, So the issue still comes down to is teaching presence. Yes. How do I pause, look you in the eyes, the soft eyes, Mm -hmm. smile, so you feel Mm -hmm. comfortable and we can have a conversation that's going to be meaningful Mm -hmm. versus one that feels like I'm being interrogated or the various other things. You know, it's not not just, you know, client patient uh, or doctor patient or Mm -hmm. whatever else. It's life. Yeah, it's any any situation. I'll give you an example. When people go out to dinner with me, they're a little surprised because the people who are serving me mm-hmm. smile mm-hmm. and are very attentive. And what I do was, is I realize everybody deserves to be acknowledged that they exist. Yes. So if I pause and when they're there, serving me their job Mm -hmm. and doing the best they possibly can if i acknowledge them as a human being that's that that fills a void of of, you know i'm just here as a servant or whatever else Mm -hmm. and so the impact of that is is they they want to be there because they realize i appreciate them as a person i appreciate their service i say thank you for everything that they do Mm -hmm. um the impact of that is uh they walk home feeling validated. Mm-hmm. They may never see me again, mm-hmm. but it gives them something to realize that that does exist, and yeah. maybe they'll yeah. model that for somebody else. Absolutely. That's so one of these days, you'll do that when you have your first <laughs> child. Yeah. Okay. Because that's usually the time that opens the heart sufficiently and get mm. totally present that you actually connect. And that's one of the few blessings of having children. It, yeah. But it, the problem is, is we lose it quickly. Mm-hmm. But the parents who actually maintain that connection, regardless of time, are the ones who, who are fully present and support them through all the four stages, whether it, you use Hindi practices, mm-hmm. um, the stages of vertical development is another model that talks about these processes. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of models out there that mm-hmm. can support us to understand what am I going through now? Mm-hmm. The issue we don't often do is 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 what's some of the roadmaps that are out there that can help me navigate this? Yeah. You know, we're we're generally lazy. <laughs> but if we mm-hmm. get curious and we go say, what are some roadmaps that says, yeah. you know, what what are the stages that I'm going through? What what's happening? And they sit down and say, Oh my goodness, that's true. That's what's going yeah. on with me right now. Just like you're thirty eight and yeah. gonna have an existential crisis. Life correction. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I've been sitting here just pining away. <laughs> So the more information we begin to sit down to evaluate how we are doing and, and what are we doing for ourselves, mm-hmm. how, how am I evolving, mm-hmm. shifts, everything. Yeah. Our whole perspective changes. And uh, the life we can create become much more comfortable. People ask me, what about joy? And I say, well, you know, joy is a moment. But the more present you get, 
I, I'm pretty contented most every day. I was going to say, like I feel when I'm grounded, you know, and focus and can slow down a little bit, I can, you can, I don't know, I can live in that space. I can live in, just like you said, that contentment. I can live in the space of the good is as great as the bad. There is like a calmness. There is a, I don't know, I just call it all joy because I don't, I'm not upset about anything. Well, it can be, it can have moments of joy, but uh, yeah, you know, there's just, peaks. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll take contentment. You'll take contentment? Yeah. Yeah, because I don't need it to be something other than it is. Than what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what you just described. Now, mm-hmm. that what you you also highlighted is I have those moments, but I don't work it very hard at creating more. <laughs> right. so, so I'm waiting for the next one to happen. That's yeah. human nature. Most yeah. people do that. They They think that it's. If I do the things society's told me I'm supposed to do, mm-hmm. I, I will be happy. I'll have the white picket fence, yeah. I'll have the family, mm-hmm. and they feel hollow. Yeah, and that that's that's men and women. Mm-hmm. You know, they've done all what they're supposed to do. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, God never wrote a manual said you're supposed to do all these mm-hmm. things. What He did suggest was is that you treat people well, treat yourself well. Mm-hmm. And that you you live a good centered life, mm-hmm. which would be have courage, respect for self and other, compassion and generosity. Mm-hmm. It breaks it down to something as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of chasing a dollar, or whatever mm-hmm. else that they chase. Yeah. And it's amazing, but like, what was the hardest thing for you that you had to like? unpack like what was the one of the hardest beliefs that you had to like let go of or change well most people struggle with this if you've been taught a very strong work ethic Mm -hmm. work ethic is based on a lot of shoulds Mm. a should Mm -hmm. so to be a good person or to be uh, have self-worth yeah um decent human being take your Mm -hmm. pick uh not be a bad person Mm -hmm. um you work um, and you're subordinate to your employer. Now, I mm-hmm. grew up in the era when it was supposedly if you put in the time, your employer would take care of you through your life. That mm-hmm. no longer exists anymore. Right. And that's completely changed even further because COVID has realized that people have a right to say, well, if you don't, if you, you can't provide my work conditions, I'm leaving. Yeah. And there's a labor shortage. So there's a whole lot of shaking and rattling going up at the top of executive suites of saying mm-hmm. is, how do we address this whole new model of doing business? Yeah. So it's, we're in a, ma- a massive state of transition. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's going to continue. And then when I apply it to you personally, is it's that same thing is, you know, what really makes me happy? Mm-hmm. So I, may, I suggest to people do this frequently is besides meditating in mm-hmm. silence and quiet, go for a walk. Yeah. Get your family, your children, your dog. Go for a walk. But when you walk this time, you have to look at things. Mm-hmm. You have to see that mm-hmm. what the neighbors are doing. You have to see what's going on around you. You know, how many times have all of us driven someplace for 30 years and one day realized that there's been a house right there that we've never seen in the entire yes. time passing mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. or that there's something else beautiful there? Mm-hmm. Uh, it goes back to the old saying is if Wherever you live, you don't pay attention very much to it. And so, for example, is is, is if you live in Niagara Falls, you don't go to the falls. That's right. for tourists. Okay? So it's the same kind of thing is we fall into these habitual ruts of how we go to work, how we do the various other things. And uh, it's taking the time meditation allows us to just ask ourselves, what am I not seeing about myself or what am I missing? What, I, what mm-hmm. am I ignoring that I really want to do? So I often have people to think about, you know, what, tell me about a dream you had that you know, you're a child. Mm-hmm. And now that will reveal the qualities of the things that they really wanted in their life. And I say, do we have it now? And if they say no, I says, wonder what it would take to get it. Mm-hmm. And you start asking the question. The interesting thing is, we already know the answer. We have to be willing and have the courage to ask the question. Yeah. And we don't. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. Is it also the courage then to like follow through? Well, follow through is a big piece of it mm-hmm. because, you know, 
the mind will allow you to distract yourself to be entertained, mm -hmm. but it will always come back to the core of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You chase shiny objects. <laughs> you're one of the most creative people I know. You can come up with more amazing ideas, but you get excited with the ideas. Yeah. What you're going to start doing in the second half of your life is picking and choosing and saying, which ones mm -hmm. do I want to do? Mm -hmm. The example is, is you're doing this with me. Mm -hmm. It's making a commitment mm -hmm. to something you've wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And... I'll, I'll, I will provide the discipline <laughs> that we don't chase too many shiny objects. <laughs> yes. And even in this uh, journey of myself, it's I had to develop this awareness too and like acceptance of um, who I am, which is running around maybe do, getting distracted or chasing shiny objects, uh, the adventurous spirit, the curiosity of life. Um, and it's funny when I moved to New York, even in my work role, um, people had started to ask me. I became aware of myself through other people. And they would ask me, like, do you have ADD? <laughs> do you have ADHD? And I really had to look and analyze that. Um, by the way, those tests are really expensive and they're outside of insurance. So <laughs> it is available that you could do that. However, I asked one of my friends that had known me, I think, since college for many years as well. And I was like, do you think that I could have ADD? Like, what do you, she's like, since I've known you, you've always been like this. This is just a part of like who you are. Um, and so accepting it and working with other people that might accept that and know that about you. Well, now we can create moves because we're working with strength, something that's not seen as such like a, a negative thing, right? Um, it's funny, I hear my mom in my head. Um, being like, oh, you just jump around. <laughs> you can't make a decision and decide one thing. And what's funny is recently I learned again that my, you know, like in Hinduism, we have a uh, spiritual guide. There's lots of gods. And so you could find the one that resonates with you. And so one of them, based on my time of birth and all those other things, is Hanuman. He's the monkey god and he jumps around like it's in the nature, right? And they call the mind the monkey mind and it does jump around. But it's about learning the other tools, just like you said, being able to ground it. Because Hanuman has, I just learned through the piece recently, that he has the ability to literally make his mind just go blank and shut it off. And it's, it's one of his gifts. Yeah. his presence. Yes, exactly. So that's what you're developing. Yeah. So... Monkey mind is kind of like, if you look at, you know, monkeys in general, they bounce around a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's why we make that correlation. But they're also smart enough to know when it's time to stop and eat a banana. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. And so it's one of the gifts you have because you get so excited and passionate about so many, so many different things. And, and, the, and the question it comes down to is, it says, okay, is it time to... Pause. Mm -hmm. Am I doing what I want to do or am I just being playful? Right. Yeah. And that that's the big shift that's going to happen is your second half of life because you begin to realize, okay, this has all been fun and great and I had a really good time. Mm -hmm. and, and the end will be a narrowing down of focus towards what you really want to do. Mm-hmm. And that's why I call midlife correction, because if we pay attention to it, we will shift our life towards that which has been calling to us mm -hmm. to create. And it's in reflection, um, with the work that I've been doing to transform the culture in the clinic, it's been a leading me to exactly this point. Like it was a grand funded position, right? So eventually it's gonna run out. We were signing up to do this certification to transform the environment. You know, culture change takes like, what, seven years, seven, 10 years. Fast track this. We're doing it in three to four during COVID. And I, I loved the idea of it. And I came in and it was about this, doing person-centered care. Mm -hmm. And I realized the way that I could do, the only way I could have done this work is by using everything that I learned from our program, from grad school, mm -hmm. that presence. Mm -hmm. creating change in people, building compassion, creating, opening their hearts. It starts with other people just being grounded and showing them dignity, you know, coming into the government environment because it's a city healthcare system. 
You have employees. They're people. They have their lives. But what I started to do was pay attention to how they were talking about it. And one of the hardest things was learning. Um, people would come in and they would describe their work time. They it would be like fifteen years. I have five years left. I have two years left. I have the conversation around their time to me felt like a prison sentence. So it didn't become, oh, what do you want to accomplish in the next five years? How do you feel about you know the two years that you have left? It was like, oh, I'm just doing my time and waiting. Till I could get out. Hmm. Um, that's how, how'd that work for you? <laughs> oh my god, it's uphill battle every day. I bet. But I had to learn within myself to build. To I'm not trying to change them. It is. I mean, I am, but in the sense of they have to want to see their life in like a different way. All I could do is open doorways. All I could do is ask questions. Maybe no one ever talked to them. Well, what do you want to do for the next five years that you're here? And if that inspires a little bit of hope that opens their heart a tiny little bit and changes their work day, even for like five minutes from that conversation with me, then it'll change the impact that they'll have on a patient. It'll change the impact that they'll have on their coworker. Sure. And so just being present right. is, I think, for me, what helped me to change some of this environment. We were able to get certified, um, but also just helped me to build such great relationships with the people that I work with and to respect like their dignity and keep them where they're at. I'm not a leader, like I wasn't, you know, but I am. Don't have that official title, but I'm a little leader in that space. But this work was calling to me and it's something that I'm like oh my god you've been preparing for this all this time and one day it, I think in one of our conversations it hit me and this was like what I want to do I want and which is what you do um holding space being grounded and allowing my presence working with my presence to just that creates enough change in itself sure it will always change help enough mm-hmm it, it makes a precious moment for many people. Yes. And so yes. that's the key to it as we continue to, to discuss uh, in the, during this podcast is, is one of the unmarked doors is not understanding the simplicity of life is actually based on learning how to be present again. Mm-hmm. So the cycle of life is we start in innocence and we end in innocence. Mm-hmm. Well, innocence is actually pure presence because the monkey mind's not ruling the roost. Mm-hmm. And so years ago, I had very ambitious like you and was going to change the world. And one day <laughs> I realized the world doesn't need change, but it would be a better world if I support one person at a time. Mm. And that is more than enough. So you did your part in there. And for me, that's where I'm at right now. I want to feel like, and it's so funny because it came from, I think, a conversation I had with my dad. And he said something to me. So what he said was, I thought you were going to change the world and we had all these like hopes that you're going to do all these things. And I looked at him and I was like, I felt all this like hurt. I was like, oh my God. But all I could look at him at that moment in time and look at him and say was, okay, I'm hearing how you feel. And I was like, but I don't think you understood maybe how I have. And to give myself that space to even own that maybe my presence, maybe the path I've been on has been able to. I got confirmed with the role that I'm in now that I definitely, well, I hope I did. We got the certification. So hopefully it made a difference, right? Sure. But I was like, you missed all the other thing. Like, I there's a cultural change that happened here. Um, there's all these wonderful things that I've done. But yeah, you got to open the perspective. We ha- you got to learn how. Maybe I didn't change it in your way yet, or maybe I have already, and you just never took the never asked, and I never showed it to you. I never brought it to you to like be like, hey, this is what I did. But um, no, I'm motivated by it. A did little he bit. respond to you? Um. He, not really. <laughs> I think maybe we could revisit the conversation because we're in a little different place um, for him to oh, take the take the time to like see. Um, but that also requires him to be in that space to be able to like receive and be grounded and sure. not in judger mode and stuff like that. The good thing about presence is it's yeah. contagious. 
Yeah. But you have to be patient. I call yeah. it patiently persistent. Yeah. So the more you're present, eventually they wake up. Yes. And that is what I think I've been seeing, that they, they're just operating out of fear, right? They want great things. They are parents. They want great things for their kids. Well, but until I show them and I have confidence in that and sure. I could stand in my own courage and like put my voice down and be there um, and not get like swayed by them, that's how they will then relax. Well, it's called external expectations. Mm-hmm. And it's not allowing you to be who you are. <laughs> yeah. So let's close for today. Um, why don't we just say goodbye to everybody? Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you joining our conversations. We hope we've uh, provided something for you that will be useful. Take care and be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>